Southern Ohio Farm Show. This is Gigi Neal of OSU Extension in Claremont County, Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. Well, I'm James Morris, the Agricultural and Natural Resources and Community Development Educator for the Ohio State University Extension in Brown County. And I'm Brooke Beam, the Ohio State University Extension Educator for Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Community Development in Highland County. And we will be your hosts for the Southern Ohio Farm Show. today on Forage Focus. In the hay business, it's important to remember that the quality of our hay can never improve beyond the day that we harvest it. From that point on, we're trying to preserve quality. In order to maximize the quality of the hay that we are able to harvest and feed to our animals, we have to balance the following factors. We're trying to find a balance between yield and quality, and the way we balance that is based on plant maturity. We know that as plants mature, yield increases, but at the same time as plants mature, their quality decreases, and that has quite a bit to do with the accumulation of fiber and the translocation of nutrients, depending on whether plants are in a vegetative growth stage or a reproductive growth stage. And so to get the best nutritional quality, we want to harvest our hay crops before they enter the reproductive stage of their life cycles. We also want to dry down our hay crop as rapidly as possible. And this is going to prevent us from having rain damage. Of course, we have to make do with the weather that we're given. Um, so rapid dry down is ideal and we want to try to plan our haymaking days based on when we have good drying conditions. We want to minimize unnecessary handling of the hay crop. The more we handle the crop, the more likely we are to have leaf shatter. And leaf shatter is a negative thing because the leaves are the most nutritious part of the plant. And if we lose parts of the leaf tissue because of shatter, that's nutritional value that's not making it into the bodies of our livestock. This is primarily a concern for legume crops because the leaf tissue is smaller, easily broken off of the main stem. And therefore, we do not recommend tedding legume crops. But however, this can also be an issue for grass forages as well if the tissue is overly dry. So we're trying to find a balance at the time of tedding and raking where our crop is still moist enough to be able to sustain that handling activity without shattering. At the same time, we want to bale that crop at the proper moisture, and this plays a key role in whether we're going to have spoilage or not in storage of these hay crops. Let's look at an example for a production doe and how her energy demands would change throughout the calendar year based on which phase of life she is in. We can see that energy demands are greatest during the periods of late gestation and through weaning. This is noted on the chart by the loss of weight during those timeframes. After weaning, it's important that we assess body condition score and decide whether this doe needs an increase in her nutrition in order to be in best shape when breeding time rolls around again. If she needs to gain weight, we certainly wanna feed her for gain. If she's in good shape, we're gonna feed for maintenance. If she needs to gain some weight, we need to be pushing our best quality feed to her. If all she needs to do is maintain body condition, we can give her a fairly low quality feed that will keep her rumen full, 
but not allow her to gain weight. Dough demands are only slightly greater than maintenance values through early and mid gestation. But when we get into the last portion of pregnancy in late gestation, her nutritional plane definitely increases and she needs a higher quality of feed during this time frame. In addition, we need to be pushing our highest quality at that time because there is less space in the rumen with the growing fetus inside to allow for increased intake. So what this means is we need more nutrition per pound of feed pushed to this pregnant doe in order for her to get enough nutrition to sustain herself and her fetus before it is born and to be healthy as she proceeds through the lactation process. Let's revisit how harvest timing affects forage quality. As plants mature, we know that forage quality declines and it declines rapidly once it enters the reproductive phase. The best harvest timing in general for legumes is between bud and early bloom. And for grasses, this is the early boot stage. In both these cases, this is when you can tell that the plant is about to flower, but has not fully produced its flower yet and has not began seed fill. If we are baling these crops at a higher moisture value, or we have a challenge with getting them dried down based on the weather conditions, wrapping can help you get hay in faster. But we have to make sure that those wet baled forages are at the appropriate moisture to allow for good fermentation. And in order to achieve good fermentation, we wanna shoot for having a moisture between 45 and 60%. This table illustrates the change in quality with an example of a small grain grass crop, showing that as the plant proceeds through the vegetative and into the reproductive phase, ending with mature hard seed, our crude protein values significantly decrease with maturity. Our fiber values increase with maturity. And as a result, the digestibility of this forage crop is reduced. We want to match our forage quality based on these factors to the nutritional needs of our livestock, depending on which phase of life they are in. We know that nutritional demands will change depending on whether the animal is pregnant, lactating, growing, or if it's just maintaining body weight to support daily activity. There's only so many things that we can do to control the environment in which we are bailing, but these are the conditions that we are hoping for and listed in the order of their importance for making good quality hay. Sunshine is most important. We need that radiant energy from the sun to get our crop dried down. Our relative humidity plays a large role as well in how quickly we will get our forages dry, along with the air temperature, the wind, and the soil moisture. On a windy day, our forages will dry out more rapidly. If the soil is moist, we're going to have difficulty getting our forages to dry down. All of these are a factor in how long it will take to get the forage to the appropriate baling moisture. Multiple factors pertaining to the actual plant affect the drying rate of our hay crops as well, including the specific species, the leaf to stem ratio, and the stem diameter. Plants with large stem diameters will take a longer period to dry down. Greater leaf tissue will aid in dry time because if we have a large ratio of stems to leaves, we have more of those stems to dry down. And then in general, our grasses do dry faster than our legume crops, so expect a longer drying time for our clovers and alfalfa. In order to speed our drying rate, Try to cut as early in the daytime as possible to maximize exposure to the sun because radiant energy is the key factor in dry down. If you have the ability to mechanically condition crops, that does help with dry down. However, conditioning can also increase leaf shatter if you're in droughty conditions. So do be cautious of which type of conditioning methods you use based on your crop. To increase drying time, spread the forage in wide swaths. A common mistake is raking the crop when it's too dry. We actually need to rake crops when they are 50 to 60% dry matter to reduce leaf shatter, as we spoke about previously. 
in the case where you know that dry down is going to be an issue, chemical conditioning can be an effective tool in aiding dry time. We've discussed quite a bit about how important getting our hay dried appropriately is for good storage conditions. Well, what is the appropriate dry matter for our hay? It depends on what size bales you're making. If you're doing small rectangular bales, we need those to be below 20% moisture before put into storage. Large round bales at less than 18% and large rectangular bales below 16%. If our moisture is too high, our bales are too wet, we increase our risks for spoilage. We also risk overheating, which is going to reduce forage quality and could potentially put us at risk for a storage fire, which no one wants to be in that situation. If our forages are too dry, we could have excessive shatter losses when we're handling those um, hay bales. If the forages are too dry, we could have excessive shatter losses as we've discussed before. However, too wet is far more common in Ohio than too dry. If you know that you have some bales that were not quite dry enough, wait to stack those in storage. Give them some time to air out. If you stack them too quickly, they can produce condensation and that can lead to mold. It's better to just wait and give it some additional dry time before stacking it in storage. When you put hay into storage, make a mental note, but also make an actual written note of what hay you have stored where, because you can have significant differences between quality as well as quantity between different cuttings. In this barn, we have both bales from first and second cuttings stored. Often you'll see better quality in second cutting hay because you can get a more timely harvest with the weather conditions, but that's not always the case. Ideally, you'd want to take a forage sample from each cutting and keep that on file for when it comes time to feed in the winter. In the case of high moisture hay, where we are going for a wet wrapped forage, remember we're trying to shoot for that 45 to 60% moisture range. It is very important to make a dense bale. We need to wrap our bales appropriately, which means at least six layers of plastic. We're going for six mils thick. And so the number of wraps that you need actually depends on the thickness of your plastic. Um, but for most cases, that's going to be at least six wraps. If your forage is very dense, uh, if you're doing a annual crop such as rye or oats or a warm season like sorghum Sudan grass, those thick stems can easily puncture through plastic and will take more wraps than fine textured forages. We want to wrap that crop as soon as possible. In most cases, waiting until the next day is too late. The forage will be too dry to get good fermentation. Remember that when it comes time to feed these bales, we want to provide an amount that they will consume quickly, ideally less than three days. So the size of bales that you're going to make if you're doing wet wrapped forages should be adapted to the number of animals that you have. If you only have six sheep and you're making large round bales, they likely will not consume that wet wrapped forage in a speedily enough fashion to prevent the accumulation of mold. So there's two factors here. We want to make the bales that are appropriate for us to handle and feed and provide the amount of food that they will consume in less than three days. There is an increased interest in using wrapped forages and the benefits are clear. It allows us to shorten the curing time necessary before we can put our hay into storage, which in turn reduces environmental damages and preserves quality. Again, remember though that quality will never be better than it was at harvest. So the act of wrapping cannot improve forage quality it only aids in preservation. Now wrapped hay comes with its own set of risks as well. There have been incidents and will continue to be incidents of botulism. Now there's two types of botulism that we tend to see related to forages. Type B is associated with improper fermentation, which is usually a result of not having the appropriate level of moisture or having a damaged bale, one where that wrap has been punctured and there's been contamination from the outside. And then there's type C 
and that occurs from accidentally feeding dead tissues. This can be an incident that happens um, if an animal is accidentally killed during the baling process or in the case of utilizing a, a fresh fertilizer or a poultry litter product that could accidentally be picked up and baled with the crop as well. Both types of botulism produce the same characteristics, which include muscle weakness, and the amount of time it takes to see those symptoms really depends on how much of the forage has been consumed. In some cases, you don't even see the symptoms before the animal perishes, and for some, it's a slow suffering. Listeriosis is also a concern, and uh, this is often called circling disease, and it does cause disorientation. Animals uh, behave oddly in that they, they move in a circling pattern. They seem distressed. Um, they may walk into a corner and, and not want to walk around, graze appropriately, socialize with other animals. This can also result in things that are more difficult to detect, including bacterial or fungal abortions. Uh, so if we're seeing reduced rates of pregnancy retention, it could be related to fungal growth within our bales. So really take those moisture ranges seriously and put enough wraps on your wet wrapped hay to, to reduce your risks of these contamination issues. This wrapper is an inline wrapper. Many people in our area use individual bale wrappers instead. There are benefits and disadvantages to both. An inline wrapper allows you to very speedily wrap lots of bales at the same time, and an individual wrapper takes more time. However, when you unwrap those individual bales, it allows you to feed at your own pace. Once you open the cover on an inline wrapped set of bales, you're starting to expose the other bales in that wrap to the elements. So you need to feed the rest of the bales that are in that line before you proceed on to feeding other types of hay. That will help you reduce waste and preserve quality. It's good to periodically check your wrapped bales for any defects that may occur in the plastic. Plastic can be susceptible to solar radiation, which can cause the plastic to degrade over time. You can also have wildlife come up and rub or claw on the bales and begin to expose the hay you have stored underneath. That's going to degrade quality if it's not caught in a timely manner. Defects in the wrap like this should be sealed as soon as possible with a silage type tape. Regular duct tape will not seal the bale effectively enough to keep contaminants from getting inside the bale. Things like this can lead to mold development over time that you may not see until you begin to unwrap the bale. And if enough time passes and the conditions are right, you could contaminate the entire line of bales in this inline wrap system. Ideally, you want to feed as much hay as the animals will consume in a short period of time, ideally one to three days. If the animals are not going to be consuming the forage in a short enough period of time, it allows the chance for other outside contaminants to begin to degrade the quality of the stored feed that you still have wrapped, as well as the feed that's in the feed trough at that current time. In this situation, this line of wrapped bales is currently being fed. However, the next line of bales also has a defect. This defect is of higher priority because we want to keep those bales to feed later on. These bales are already being fed, so the contamination's not as concerning as those which will be stored for a longer period of time. The conditions in which your hay is stored will make a big difference in the nutritional value and acceptance of that hay when you feed it. We know that bales stored under cover will be best protected from the elements, but many producers do not have the ability to store hay inside and use alternative methods of storage. We're going to be discussing some of the benefits and disadvantages of different hay storage systems and how you can prioritize hay to feed based on the conditions it's stored in. After going through all that effort to harvest the best quality hay possible, we certainly want to protect it once we get it into storage. Now, under Ohio condition, 15 
to 40% dry matter losses are expected when storing hay outside. Nutrient losses will actually exceed the dry matter losses. What good is the empty hay if it has no nutritional value? It's almost always economically justified to either cover the bales or store them inside. This can result in a 10 to 1 return on investment. If we look at an example for a 5 by 6 foot round bale that weighs 1,000 pounds, and we assume that it's worth $120 a ton, so in this case that would be $60 per bale. Well, the price of that forage changes quite a bit if we factor in the loss. And remember that a small amount of hay loss from the outside adds up because the circumference of the bale is larger towards the outside and smaller towards the inside. So one inch of spoilage on the outside equates to 6% loss of the bale. And that means instead of it being worth $120 a ton, it's worth $128 a ton because that's what's edible. If we have three inches of spoilage, that equates to 19% loss, increasing the cost to $148 per ton. If we have six inches of spoilage, that equates to 36% and increases the cost of that feed to $187 of edible forage per ton. So what are we really investing in these feeds? If we factor in the spoilage, that can occur if we store it inappropriately. It's a lot more expensive than we may think. Even bales stored inside will have some loss, probably just due to the methods in which we're feeding it. Inside storage can be estimated to be between 5 and 10% dry matter. But when we're storing outside, dry matter losses from 10 to 40% are relatively common. There are multiple ways that we can reduce the effects of storage loss, even just the addition of net wrap rather than a twine wrap, a tied twine wrap, can decrease those losses significantly. A wrapped in plastic bale will significantly reduce our losses as well. We also need to think about how we're storing it when we set it on the ground. If we have the ability to elevate the bales off of the soil, that will prevent moisture wicking through the bottom of the bale. The way we orient our bales while in storage also matters. Ideally, we want to orient our bales from north to south so that they get the full range of sunlight when the sun rises in the east and sets in the west to keep those bales as dry as possible in storage. Whether you buy hay or sell hay, you're probably doing quite a bit of hay judging, judging your own or judging others. And hay judging is important for determining marketable value. And this is based on a variety of indicators of quality. Now our decision should be made based on both the physical characteristics and the chemical analysis of our forages. There are many things you can do using your senses of sight, smell, and touch to help evaluate quality. However, the most reliable source and the one that we recommend to everyone is to pay the money to have your forages tested. It likely will cost you around $25 to get a good hay test and it is well worth its weight in gold. The factors that you can use as indications of hay quality include leafiness, maturity, odor, color, softness, purity, bale condition, and penalties. Now our bale condition is one that we are talking about a lot today when deciding which hay we will feed first. Bales should be uniform in size and shape. This makes it easier to store and easier to feed. Our wet wrapped bales must be adequately covered for protection from the weather and to prevent spoilage. If we have issues with the condition of our bales, we need to feed that forage as quick as possible to reduce the incidence of loss, both the loss of dry matter and the loss of nutritional value. Take home messages from today's episode of Forage Focus include these. Do your best to balance forage maturity and bale moisture to create the best quality hay nature will allow. This happens long before the day you feed that bale. It happens on the day of harvest. Keep notes, records of what the conditions were when you baled so that months later when you're taking this hay out of storage, you have an indication of what bales are highest quality and how to prioritize them for your animal's needs. Don't waste your high quality hay by storing it poorly. 
Elevate bales off the ground to reduce wicking of moisture through the soil. Keep them under cover as much as possible, whether that's under the cover of plastic wrap or net wrap or under the cover of a barn. We lose a lot of high quality hay just by improper storage. And then remember to feed your highest quality hay when it matches the nutritional needs of your livestock. Late gestation and lactation are the peak times of energy requirement for breeding livestock. And if you're trying to finish animals on a forage crop, remember that the, the energy needed for gain is high. So save your highest quality forage crops to match those nutritional needs of your livestock, depending on their stage of life. If you have additional questions about how to handle forages, how to determine factors of quality, and how to implement them into your feeding programs, visit and follow these pages for additional information. There's a wealth of knowledge available from the forage team, the beef team, and the sheep team available at your fingertips anytime, day or night. Make sure to check these websites out and subscribe to future updates. Great footage. How about this? Perfect. I can see one right there behind you. Yeah. yeah. I did. But. <laughs> <laughs>